So this talk is designed to give a bit of an overview of some of the things I've been working on, but also the work of the Reproductive Sociology Research Group, which is based in the Department of Sociology. So the talk is divided into four sections. Um, the first section, I'm hoping to tell you maybe some unusual things about where IVF comes from. I think there's a pretty established narrative about where in vitro fertilization comes from. It was invented by Robert Edwards here at Cambridge in coordination with Patrick Steptoe and Oldham. And Louise Brown was the first tested baby born in 1978, just had her 40th uh, birthday this summer. Um, the second part of this paper looks at the expansion of IVF to become one of the central platforms in the bioeconomy, which is something I think um, maybe isn't so well appreciated about this technology. The third part is about what I'm calling the post-Malthusian condition, and um, then I have some conclusions. So the first section, where did IVF come <coughs> from? Um, well, briefly to summarize the theme of this talk, IVF was born in the barn, the lab, the war, the NHS, and the baby boom. And we could actually add quite a bit to this list. But one of the very important aspects of the history of reproductive technology, the history of reproductive engineering that I want to talk about in this paper is the very broad geopolitical origins of a technology that's often primarily associated with individual uh, fertility treatment. So let's begin with World War II where, as you probably know, there were very, very severe food shortages here in the United Kingdom. Actually, for nine years after the war ended, there were still um, very significant food shortages here. In United Kingdom, and in 1947, the Agriculture Act was established to, um, to, to enable greater food security. And this region of the country, East Anglia, was very typical of the quite dramatic and I think we could say revolutionary changes that took place in the post-war period with the huge merging of many, many small fields into much larger fields in order to enable much larger machinery, in particular combine harvesters, to um, deliver food on a scale previously unknown um, in this country. Increased use of industrial fertilizers, irrigation and drainage, new um, reproductively engineered seeds um, that would enable more high yield um, crops, that would enable um, more intensive harvesting, in particular, of cereal. Um, the Green Revolution, as many of you will know, was widely viewed as a means to harness increased reproductivity and fertility. And in this country, as in many other countries, those revolutionary changes to agriculture were undertaken as part of a nationalized program of biological control, which was, in many ways, a program of control of fertility. Fertility of the soil, fertility of the seeds, and um, as we'll see, fertility of animals. So this was also a process of biological unification. Um, huge transformations to the landscape. 75,000 miles of hedgerows were removed between the beginning of the war in 1990. 97% of the <coughs> wildflower meadows were turned over to agricultural production. 50 million birds have disappeared since 1960. Um, these statistics will be familiar to you. And the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Foods, which is now DEFRA, was um, leading this very conscious, rational effort to um, improve agricultural production. Um, this was also a period when um, the use of fertilizers, a technology developed, as you may know, um, for explosives during the war, um, began to um, expand. Um, in 1955, 37 different industrial chemical compounds were approved for agricultural use. During the 1970s, this number increased to 136, and by 1974, 344 different pesticide compounds were available for use on British farms. Um, so this boom, this huge boom in um, agriculture was um, mainly focused on, as I say, on, on, on increasing crop yield. But it was also um, 
organized around increasing um, livestock production. So a huge part of this program was the development of new seeds, but also new lines of cattle, pigs, sheep, poultry, um, and other um, agricultural livestock, um, which involved greater control over um, animal reproduction, but also over um, genetics, inheritance, um, and in particular, the relationship between fertility and genetics became a major subject um, in this period. Um, so these techniques developed in sheep, um, cows, pigs, which have a reproductive system not entirely unlike that of humans, also began the process of being transferred into human application. Um, and the Imperial Bureau of Animal Breeding, which was um, based here in the UK, that had links all over the world, um, was at the center of a network of research universities and animal research stations that were very much geared towards improving <coughs> the efficiency of the livestock animal using techniques such as artificial insemination, um, in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer, gestational surrogacy, and also the freezing of gametes, which was developed here at Cambridge, um, like many significant Cambridge um, discoveries by mistake. Um, so it's worth putting this um, in the context of Cambridge just for a moment, because Cambridge played an absolutely vital role in this. The animal research station that was on Huntington Road until the mid-1980s was one of the leading centers for the improvement of mammalian genetics and reproduction. Robert Edwards spent a lot of time there. Um, Steve Lewidson, who cloned Dolly the Sheep, trained and worked at um, the Animal Research Station in Cambridge. And IVF really began its life as a vital technological platform in animal research stations like the one here at Cambridge. Um, and like the one at Edinburgh, where um, Robert Edwards trained. Um, it's worth mentioning that um, many of these technologies had strong links to the military, and there was a major shift going on in this period of investment from war technology, from military technology during World War II into the life sciences. The National Science Foundation in the United States was founded with the explicit purpose of transferring many of the investments made for military weapons, including atomic energy, into the life sciences, and that's how Rob, uh, James Watson um, came here to Cambridge um, to our old home over there on Free School Lane in 1951. So in, to summarize, um, the traditional sort of links between industry, agriculture, and military that we, we often use to understand the means of production, to understand changes in the political economy of production, to understand the national economy, to understand technological innovation are really in this period control over the means of reproduction very, very explicitly. Um, and I won't go into the military applications of this in detail, but that's a very important part of the story. So let's move along to part two, the IVF platform in the bioeconomy. So returning to this um, constellation of where does IVF come from, um, we need to remember that um, the period when IVF was being developed here at Cambridge, the 1960s and the 1970s, was a period of um, the development of the welfare state, the development of the NHS, and a period of significant social liberalization, liberalization of the laws on divorce, on homosexuality, on censorship, on abortion, and in many ways the um, foundation of the um, NHS in 1948 and the um, legalization of the Abortion Act in 1967 were, were very important landmarks in this period of liberalization, <coughs> economic reform, and the emergence of universal social care, which was in many ways seen as a kind of compensation or reciprocity for the um, sacrifices of World War II. So the oral contraceptive pill was introduced in 1971, 1974 it was 
legalized, and then right after RVF was first successful in 1978, <coughs> Margaret Thatcher was elected. And of course, this marked a very significant transformation politically here in the UK. And it's very, very interesting that IVF, a technology that really emerged in animals and in humans, out of work during this long period of <coughs> forming the NHS, forming the welfare state, and liberalizing British society, um, took place on the eve of a huge political shift and the beginning, really, of a backlash against many of those changes. Um, because as we know, Margaret Thatcher was not hugely keen on what she called the nanny state. She preferred what she called the enterprise culture. She undertook a program of mass privatization. You know, if she could see it, it was British and it moved. She privatized it. Um, she wanted a society of stakeholder citizens. She famously said, there's no such thing as society. There are only individuals and their families. Um, and really, for Margaret Thatcher, those were ideally shareholding individuals. And so, as a result oops, sorry, of this, um, IVF in the 1980s, somewhat ironically, became a bellwether for health privatization. And NHS, NHS consultants were given new contracts, which enabled them to charge fees for their services. Tax breaks were extended to private health care. As you may know, Margaret Thatcher <coughs> was very keen to privatize the NHS, and many believe this was one of the reasons for her downfall, um, famously felled by her own party's hand. Um, she set up a uh, kind of private healthcare sector to parallel the NHS in order to act as an impetus to get rid of it altogether. Um, but she was unsuccessful in doing that. However, in the meantime, IVF, which as I say, became really almost like a prototype for private healthcare, became an almost entirely private sector. So um, um, by... Um, 1991, after IVF had been around for, what, 13 years, there were 64 assisted conception clinics here in the UK, which is a lot um, within that short period of time, only three of which were in the public sector. Um, so a number of um, um, historians and social scientists have written about this period. Naomi Pfeffer, in her book, The Stork and the Syringe, A History of Reproductive Medicine, points out that obstetrics and gynecology were one of the medical professions to benefit most from private health care, in part because of IVF. Um, she argues that during the 1980s, IVF alone, quote unquote, transformed the balance sheet of gynecology beyond all recognition. Um, this is when they got all started to be able to buy handmade shoes. Um, Marilyn Strathern similarly describes the enterprising up of reproduction that she argues converted the yearning for parenthood into an opportunity to achieve conception, um, which she argues transforms the cultural logic of social connection, of kinship, attachment into um, one of transactional intent, um, which she argues in turn performs a naturalizing function on enterprise, being analogous to the achieving transactional family, um, which she argues um, epitomized the shift in cultural values that took place during that time. So it's also worth mentioning um, that during the 1980s, a very important feedback cycle began to become more apparent, whereby in vitro fertilization, which was generating more and more human embryo research, began to um, become a kind of experimental platform using human embryos, in which human embryos increasingly began to be used as investigative tools and models, and leading to many of the most important scientific breakthroughs of the 1990s, including the discovery of human embryonic stem cells, the cloning of Dolly the sheep, etc. So this cycle whereby um, clinical treatment um, becomes a feeder system for basic science, which in turn is changing fundamental understandings of biology. There's an absolutely key cycle that goes on in this period, and pretty much every book I've written is about that shift. A fundamental change in the meaning of the biological 
that connects human reproductive assistance to a means of harnessing biological control. Um, yeah, so that's the central argument of this book, um, in which I've argued that um, technology <coughs> becomes increasingly biologized. The embryo as a tool is an example of biologization of technology, which both contribute to the transformation of the biological into a more relative condition, somewhat fittingly, perhaps, by making new biological relatives. Um, I've called this the obvious stem cell interface. That's the cycle I just showed you. Um, we now know that any cell can be made reproductive. You can make a mouse out of a skin cell. The mouse can reproduce and have little mice. The entire system of um, biological determinism that was assumed to be inevitable, linear, singular, in one way, has become a um, reversible, reprogrammable system. And much of the bioeconomy today is based on that principle. Um, also during this period, there's a kind of merger of many of the biological platforms. Avia with stem cells, stem cells with genetic engineering, genetic engineering with agriculture, embryo transfer with um, gestational surrogacy, gestational surrogacy with IVF with genetic modification, et cetera, et cetera. This is what's going on at the moment. A lot of it being done here at Cambridge. And of course, there are new emerging markets, although one of the points I'd like to make is that most of them are not very financially profitable, um, other than the fertility sector, which dwarfs these other sectors in both its financial and commercial value. Um, and um, the point I've tried to make is that although that's significant, that there's a major economic or bioeconomic element to this transformation, these transformations are also cultural. Because biology isn't just a um, means of you know growing things or planting things or reproducing things. Biology is also a belief system. It's a very powerful cultural element in how we understand identity, embodiment, health and illness, etc. Okay, so um, the kinds of mergers I have tried to describe are about these um, elements coming together and in biological relatives so on page one. You know, um, trying to describe how IVF has linked together um, these different platforms. And we've just seen, you know, very recently this autumn, CRISPR Cas9, the gene editing platform, explicitly linked to the IVF platform, which in turn will have implications for how cells can be programmed. IPS cells are induced pluripotent cells. And um, HSEC cells are human embryonic stem cells. So the link between IVF, gene editing, stem cells is one of the most important areas of biological innovation by far. And the main question on the table for many of the ethical groups in the United Kingdom right now um, is whether, is the extent to which this should be used for human um, reproduction. So, um, moving right along, part three. Um, since the 1990s, what we've also seen at the same time is a um, conspicuous, <coughs> rapid, and precipitous global fertility decline. Not in the aggregate numbers of population, but in the fertility rate. This is a very conspicuous feature of the current political climate, as well as the current um, debates around global planning. Okay, so there's a lot of implications of these that I just want to cover briefly. Um, at the same time, there's been this very conspicuous global decline with many countries entering a fertility situation of ultra low fertility that's so far below replacement rate, it's imagined that replacement may never happen. Um, at the same time, there's been this decline. There's been a huge expansion of the fertility services. It's a $20 billion market. It's a huge private market. There's no genetic technologies that are being marketed direct to consumer at that level. It's an, it's an unparalleled market. Um, so probably 5 million, well, definitely 5 million, but probably more like 10 million IVF babies have been born worldwide. 
At the same time, you'll have noticed infertility has become much more directly linked to environmental toxicity. Um, environmental toxicity has become much more closely linked to, to industrial agriculture, obviously not only that. Um, and as a result, a trend that we're seeing right now is that governments are starting to take a much more direct interest, not only in fertility, but in fertility assistance, in IVF, and in fertility technologies. This is happening at the same time that the fertility market is now being increasingly directed at the young and the fertile population. It used to be directed at the infertile population, which is a lot smaller. Um, now the bioeconomy, I would argue, is being much more linked to what I call fertinomics um, globally. Um, and since we're sociologists, we can just make up words like that. <laughs> Big advantage of being sociologists. OK, so um, one of the most important theories of fertility is the Malthusian model of fertility. It basically postulates that since population increases exponentially, while food production only increases arithmetically, increases in population lead to social unrest and political conflict, driven by food shortages. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. Um, you know, um, classic enunciations of this doctrine are would be the Club of Rome, Limits to Grove, Paul Ehrlich. There's a lot of problems with this model. Um, it's never been really proven theoretically. There's a lot of historical exceptions you can find to these principles. This model, like many models of fertility, is largely ideological. This has been an extremely powerful ideological model. It has been a much less persuasive empirical one. Um, the other major theory of fertility is demographic transition theory. Um, this more recent theory postulates that the transition um, from higher birth and death rates to lower birth and death rates is one of the key drivers of improved quality of life, one of the key transitions associated with modernity and development. And for global planners, this model of demography has often been associated with what's <coughs> called the demographic bonus of enabling a country to improve its economic performance by controlling reproduction. Um, this theory, too, has been very intensely debated to the extent of really asking whether it's a theory at all or whether it's just a kind of hypothesis that can, in some cases, provide a somewhat convincing model of what has happened. But there's many cases that disprove the demographic transition theory. It's very much debated, and again, it's very typical of models of fertility, which are, frankly, kind of vague and causally very weak. So here's the current um, UN projection for um, global population. You'll notice Europe. Um, shows a, um, um, is, is leading in some ways the decline. Um, Europe is also where the most IVF and assisted conception takes place at the moment, although that might change. You'll see um, there's quite a bit of variation in what the fertility projections are, with the dotted, the hyphenated line being the upper limit, the um, shaded area being the potential variation in this projection. And you'll see that um, you know, there's quite a wide variation in what the fertility rates might be. And this, too, is very typical of, fertility, of the study of fertility, that they're often very inaccurate. Um, and um, you can see the global, it's not really clear. Is it going up or is it going down? Well, one thing we can see is that the rate of increase has slowed. Right now is when the rate of increase is not only slowing, but dropping, right? Um, Okay, was there too much fertilizer? Maybe. Um, if we look at both of these theories in light of the past 50 years, we can see that although their premises were never very strong to begin with, they're even weaker now. Um, now, food production itself may be decreasing fertility. The rate of population growth has been declining since the 1960s. The rate, not the amount, remember, the rate. Climate change is reducing both food production and fertility, 
at the same time. So this is a different correlation between food production and fertility than was predicted in this famous model. Um, and of course, anthropogenic factors were not included in this theory to begin with, not surprisingly since it was in the um, late 18th century. Um, and so um, in many ways, those drivers now supersede the variables that were used by Malthus. And similarly, demographic transition theory, many highly developed countries are now experiencing ultra low fertility. In some regions, ultra low and ultra high fertility rates closely coexist. Um, including both industrialized and less industrialized countries. Lower fertility is now increasingly associated with higher levels of industrialization, and industrialization has therefore become a driver of lower infertility rates. Again, really um, pretty much um, making the premises of those theories um, even weaker. So um, what we see now are a new set of concerns we see a new set of concerns about these new factors, these new correlations, these new relationships between food, security, fertility, etc. cetera. Um, and interestingly, the turn is right back to the same origins of these problems. So we see increasing interest in the use of new reproductive technologies to address fertility decline, even though those technologies are themselves derivative of a cycle <coughs> that may be produced fertility decline. We see a cycle of experimentalization whereby understandings derived from the novel modification of living reproductive systems is being fed back into basic science. So it's now possible to trace with incredibly fine detail which particulate matter is in the human body. And it's possible to trace that right into the ovary, right into the egg. And now it's possible to take those tracer particles and extrapolate into how they're <coughs> circulating, say, in a city like London. So what we're getting is we're getting human clinical material, human clinical tissue, now providing a, a sort of signaling system about wider questions of the environment, about urban planning, and so forth. And again, this loop, this loop between how IVF is being used to feed into basic science is a loop that IVF very much inaugurated in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, and IVF is also prototypic of the bringing together of several different technological platforms to approve reproductive outcomes. For example, the use of a lot of new data that are coming from um, human clinical um, IVF programs and also um, regenerative medicine and so forth. So um, an approach which you can, I think, understand has become much more influential is the attempt to study fertility as a situated, localized um, condition. Um, many models of fertility change have increasingly turned to smaller scale studies of situated fertilities and our new research in reproductive sociology group is very much taking this approach, very much associated with Susan Greenhaw. Um, and her work on China, as well as on um, ethnographies of fertility. Um, and, um, and I'll say a little bit more about this approach when we get to the final part. Okay, so we've looked at this picture of how the different um, origins of um, intersections can tell us about the current situation, the current changes in fertility globally. Um, and I just want to say a little bit about how is the Reproductive Sociology Research Group approaching these questions. Because this group is one of the only groups here at Cambridge to be studying these questions, interestingly. Um, so this group was established in 2012 to, um, to research um, the intersection of reproduction and technology to develop more generalizable claims about the relationships between biology and social change. Um, because reproduction has really become one of the most important sites to understand that relation. Um, these include changing social and ethical values, new kinship formations, etc. Um, and um, uh, we have a web page, we have um, listings of all the events, projects, publications, etc. Um, which you can visit. We have a number of activities. We have an inaugural public lecture every year. We have events, we have reading groups, um, and so forth. 
um, in a big conference last summer where we had researchers from all over the world, including many early career researchers coming here to Cambridge to um, share emerging work in this space, which is really um, expanding rapidly. Um, we have a very big project, which has now been running for nearly 20 years, actually, um, on the history of IVF, um, including the history of IVF here at Cambridge. Um, we're working with the British Library, where we've deposited a lot of archives and interviews related to the emergence of IVF here in the UK. Um, we had an ESRC seminar series on this, and we've had a series of Welcome Trust Awards, really kind of studying this sequence, how radiation biology <laughs> during the war increased the interest in the mammalian um, system of inheritance because of the effects of radiation, which is difficult to study. It's difficult to study mammalian reproduction because you don't get, get an egg, you know? It's not like you can do a sea urchin, like, you know, it's right there in front of you. It's very difficult to study mammalian reproduction, and increasingly the study of mammalian reproduction in mice and other species led to all of these human applications, and as I said, have led to such rapid transformations in basic biological understandings of reproduction and inheritance that I call it now transbiology. Um, so these are some of the interviews we've done. These are all publicly accessible in the British Library. <coughs> it's increasingly important to have publicly accessible databases these days. Um, <laughs> and um, we found um, the Warnock Files. That was exciting. Um, in Burnley. Who knew they were in Burnley? Um, and um, we've published quite a bit. We found the archives in the Bourne Hall, Robert Edwards archive we've deposited here at Cambridge. We've, we've been trying to record this history. A lot of um, this history has been um, lost or not told or disappeared. And we've gradually expanded from UK to global IVF. So I just want to tell you a few of the other projects, we have a project with China's largest um, IVF clinic, um, which is an ongoing project with several partners um, looking at the development of IVF and its use in China. Um, we have uh, Marchen Spintana runs a um, program that derives from his Marie Curie work on gay men using surrogacy, so we have a big LGBTQ reproduction strand to our work um, at the moment. We have a project run by Janelle Lamoureux and Katie Dow on um, <coughs> the environment and reproduction, based in part on um, Katie's book, um, Making a Good Life. Um, we have a project we did with Jackie Scott um, with the Philomathia Foundation on infertility education and reproductive health with Nitsan Perry Rotem, who's now a uh, lecturer at Exeter in sociology. Um, Karen Gent and Noemi Merleponti are leading a project um, here at Cambridge with the Center for Trophoblast Research and Azim Sarani's lab on the cycle of how Avia feeds into basic research and how that basic research um, feeds back into new applications. So this is a sort of cycle of translation that we're working on called Life in Translation. Also with a number of partners in other European countries, Robert Prelot led this very important study on men's attitudes to intimate life, looking at the use of assisted conception technologies in the context of HIV, um, positive health, um, sexual health, and um, introducing the concept of repro sexual health. Um, Karen Gent has made a film, which is now becoming a game about how scientists culture cells in the lab based on some of our ethnographic work, and she also leads a project on biocircularities, which is a different way of looking um, at changes to the biological as a result of um, understandings derived from reproduction and reproductive cells, um, exploring changing models of biological temporality. We see Vanderbilt leads the big welcome outreach project, which um, called Life in Glass has its own website um, which you can visit. Um, we had an art exhibit this summer at Marie Edwards exploring again many of these themes linked to our conference and now part of the Life in Glass um, project which we hope will eventually become an exhibit at the Morgan Trust. Um, Lucy also recently joined the Alan Turing Institute um, and her work on the datafication of reproduction 
um, has um, a lot of very significant implications in terms of this merger between digital and <coughs> biological technologies. And it's just worth mentioning that um, Alan Turing, um, you know, who was um, a pioneer in the development of artificial intelligence, um, wrote one of his last papers um, under the influence of Anne McLaren, um, a biologist here at Cambridge, um, using the chemical basis of morphogenesis present in the process of embryogenesis, embryogenesis as a model for where computing might go. So this interface between the digital, the virtual, and the biological is an area that, um, again, will have very significant implications for how we understand um, not just artificial intelligence, but early human development. Um, he derived his closing theories from embryology. Um, we've had a big program of public engagement, um, <coughs> looking at people's perceptions of changing fertility and infertility, and trying to track their changing perceptions of the fertility industry, which is now a big issue for a lot of people thinking about um, parenting. And we've <coughs> expanded our work on the history of IVF globally, publishing in this journal, um, which I um, edit along with Martin Johnson, Reproductive Biomedicine Online, um, where we're publishing a lot of our work in open access, which is also going to become increasingly important along with open databases. Um, and our new project, Changing Infertilities, is taking these um, questions further with a network of 34 partners in 16 different countries. And we are going to be looking at and comparing fertility transitions based on how fertility is being perceived differently and how those changing perceptions are driving different kinds of behavior individual behavior, state behavior, um, behavior of other <coughs> parties. Um, so just want to say a little bit, we are at a time where there are more and more sort of key concepts in this field. Um, this is like a special section of the talk dedicated to the field review um, people, essay writers. Um, <laughs> distributed reproduction, a view of reproduction not as a series of isolated events like pregnancy, childbirth, etc., but as a system, an integrated system of flows, um, stratified reproduction concept taken from Shelley Cohen's work, how reproduction is structured in a way that the assisted reproduction of some is directly dependent upon and enabled by the compromised reproductivity of others. Um, there's a lot of work at the moment on reproductive labor. Obviously, there's a lot of work on surrogacy, a lot of work on transnational. Um, reproductive markets, um, increasing work on reproductive justice, issues about um, reproductive um, discrimination continue to be very important. Um, and this is one of the key questions from our MPhil, the MPhil pathway in the sociology of reproduction is Angela Davis at the University of Reproduction. And I just want to end on this note um, because, of course, the answer is obviously yes. Um, and drawing on some of her earliest work, for example, her work on um, the black woman's role in the community of slaves, is really a terrific example of how feminist attention to um, social reproduction, biological reproduction, reproduction of the household, um, are linked to systems of labor and indeed to broad global economic systems and can't be understood outside of those systems. Um, and Catherine Median, who is also a member of the Reproductive Postdocs, is leading the work package on stratified infertilities as well as the events related to Angela Davis's visit um, this term. Just to let you know. Um, our newest um, postdoc, Sigrid Vertemann, um, runs the Reproduction and Resistance um, Reading Group in London. She'll be joining us in May. She'll be leading the Political Economy of Fertility work package for us. And there's, yeah, there's really a huge expansion of books in our field at the moment. So it's a very, very exciting time 
to be working in this field because there's so much being published all the time. This has become a huge area. Um, it's very exciting to be teaching in this area at the same time, too. So, what is the sociology of reproduction all about? Well, obviously, it's about everything. <laughs> it's about every aspect of human sociology and political economic activity, all the sub-disciplines of reproduction of sociology and its related disciplines, all the topics we study, um, all aspects of social theory, um, all aspects of social inequality and stratification, and, you know, importantly, the, some of the most important connections between sociology and other disciplines. Um, but what I want to end on, really, is also what this area introduces to us, because I think the fact that reproduction has been so under-theorized means we can't just sort of slot it in to the existing models from Foucault or Malthus or demographic transition theory or, or many of the other um, sociological theories they have really neglected the importance of reproduction. Um, we need a different kind of lens, and that's really what I'm offering the sociology of, what I'm saying the re sociology of reproduction offers is a different kind of lens, a different kind of methodology, a different way of understanding social causality. At the end of the day, that is the really um, important message from the sociology of reproduction is that it offers us a different set of perspectives on the fundamental sociological categories that we use all the time. And I just want to relate this to a quote that Professor Shirley Tate made at a sociology departmental seminar last year, last October. I don't know if um, many of you were there, but um, she talked about how her work tries to connect the feeling in the room to the fabric of everyday life, to the structures of the institution, to the wider structures of the world. And she was actually talking about education when she made that comment, a very personal comment to her, as well as a very, very important methodological comment that would apply equally well to the work of Angela Davis. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to connect the feeling in the room to the fabric of everyday life, to the structures of the institution, to the wider structures of the world and we're trying to use the sociology of reproduction as a different kind of methodology and a different perspective with which to investigate the causes of things. So, thank you very much.